Hi class, uh, we now move into looking at the ecology of the whole ecosystem and the community um, that is a coral reef. We've talked about the geology, we've done uh, reviews of all the main organisms uh, that live there, and now we just want to look at the bigger picture, how um, the, um, the coral reefs are organized, and that's going to be part one of um, these next set of lectures. And the second part is what interactions regulate this organization? What are the key um, biological interactions between organisms that are important um, to reef systems? So um, first part then, organization, structure. Second part, um, dynamics uh, and interactions. Here are the key points for this part of our, our coverage of reef community and ecosystem ecology. Uh, and I'll just go through them quickly with you because we're going to cover them in more detail. Um, number uh, one, the first one is that the reef ecosystems don't exist alone. There's some very strong connections between the reefs themselves and the surrounding communities and habitats, and we'll discuss that. Um, second, we're going to go into the sort of the construction, the structure of the reef system and how it's shaped by physical and biological forces that create habitat zones at different distances from the shoreline. Third, we're going to talk about the three-dimensional structure of the reefs, the rugosity, how we measure that and why the three-dimensional structure is important to um, aspects of the community, including especially diversity. Next, we're going to talk about fish themselves and why fish diversity is high. Um, there, um, there are going to be um, three or four hypotheses that we'll go through quickly. These hypotheses try to explain why we have such high fish diversity in coral reefs and why there are so many of the similar types of fish um, in the reefs and throughout the world. Uh, and finally, we'll just discuss the food web. This food web is a structural component of the reef uh, systems, and so we're going to talk about who eats whom, what the important connections are uh, in the reef um, food web, and uh, end with that. And then the next time, we'll talk about the uh, key interactions um, that are going on and talk about spe in specific terms. The first important point I want to make, as you see uh, A here, is that coral reefs are linked to other communities. They are influenced and have very important linkages or connections to adjacent systems. And so we'll go through the list uh, of the three main connections that exist. First of all, number one, reefs are connected to the terrestrial habitats that are nearby because those terrestrial habitats uh, are the source of lots of nutrient runoff. Uh, into the reef systems and organic material that washes off with rain. So that provides nutrients and even uh, food for animals that live in the reef proper uh, and for the plants that live there as well. Second, there's a linkage with the open ocean. A lot of the organisms, and especially including some of the small fish that live in the reef itself, feed on plankton that's brought into the shore by, from the open ocean by currents and waves. And third, um, there is a very, very important connection between the reefs and the surrounding seagrasses and mangrove uh, habitats along coastal regions. Seagrasses and mangrove swamps, uh, both places that we'll visit when we go to San Salvador, provide subsidies in terms of nutrients and organic material that wash off from the seagrasses and the mangrove into the reef habitat itself. And they also serve as nursery grounds for juveniles of lobsters, snapper, uh, parrotfish, all kinds of um, reef organisms that spend their early life uh, either, uh, well, in both mangrove swamps, swamps and seagrass meadows before they make their way out to the reef proper. And it's been shown, very importantly, that fish biomass in coral reefs is 40 to 120 percent higher in the Caribbean when reefs are associated with nearby mangroves and seagrass meadows, especially mangroves. So it's 
said, and it's a very important point to make, that there is, rather than an isolated reef system, that there is a continuum uh, between these three systems that um, have um, linkages to one another and some very important interactions. So we say there's a mangrove seagrass reef continuum rather than just an isolated reef system. The slide you see here is from a very important paper by a, a well-known ecologist, Peter Mumby and colleagues, who did um, quite a bit of work along mangrove-rich and mangrove-scarce systems <clears throat> um, off the coast of Belize and other parts of Central America and the Mesoamerican Reef. And so they compared the biomass of coral reef fishes in patch reefs and four reef habitats. In this case, this is length, not biomass. But this is a study where they found uh, the high percentage of enhancement of fish biomass in mangrove-associated reef systems. And so what you can see here is uh, data specifically for the blue striped grunt, Emulon skyurus. And what it shows is that in areas where there are seagrasses, and mangroves associated with patch reefs and reef proper, um, sort of offshore reefs, right? You can see, if you look at the x-axis here, that the fish biomass, especially in the patch reef or the fish size, especially in the patch reef, is on average much higher than in areas where mangroves are lacking. There may be seagrasses but no mangroves. So it looks like the mangrove, both as a source of food and as a nursery ground for fishes, actually makes it um, so that once the fish get to the reef itself, they tend to be quite a bit bigger. And a big fish, right, when they arrive in these complex reef habitats with lots and lots of predators, a bigger juvenile fish will probably enjoy a higher survival than the smaller ones that come from coastal areas where there is no mangrove, um, or at least no extensive mangrove region. So mangroves enhance the size of fishes entering the reefs that should translate into a higher survival and higher recruitment and bigger fish uh, in the population overall really affecting the ecology of the reef system. We can just look at this diagram that illustrates this idea of a continuum um, focusing on the kind, some of the habitats that we'll see uh, in San Salvador Island. So this is very typical of the south and southwest or southeast coast uh, of San Salvador. And what you can see as you go from shoreline um, to offshore is sort of the interaction or the connectedness um, between these different um, different ecosystems, starting with right along um, the land's edge, um, the mangroves, um, and then just offshore from the mangroves, right? And remember, the mangroves have roots where small fish are, are able to survive and get bigger before they venture out into the real world, for example, uh, into seagrasses or into patch reefs along the coastal region um, where... Um, they would enjoy greater success for being uh, for being bigger. Okay, so you go from the mangroves to the inner tidal, which we'll visit, then to um, the hard offshore bottom, into some patch reefs and seagrass areas and areas dominated by uh, green algae before we get into uh, sort of the reef crest region that has lots of uh, corals and fire coral and the like, eventually ending up on this very steep wall um, which we see in a lot of places in San Salvador where, where corals uh, really thrive. But the whole point is that uh, there is some proximity here and there's definitely some interaction with a net movement of nourishment, subsidies, uh, offshore into the reef systems from the richer uh, shoreline vegetation and shoreline communities, and that there's exchange the other way with the reef providing a lot of its offspring little fish and shrimp and the like who move into the seagrasses first and then into the mangroves um, to find a refuge and feed before they ever make it back out to their adult 
uh, environment. So San Salvador is very much like those meso uh, American reefs in showing the presence of this uh, continuum and very important linkages between the components associated with the reef system and the reef itself. The next I okay, the next idea about uh, reef structure that I want to share with you is um, this phenomenon of zonation, okay, with respect to depth and distance from shore. And what that means is that as you move from near shore to offshore, right, there might be a, a reef system there, but the type of corals and fishes and habitat that you find really change as the distance from shore. Uh, increases, uh, and the ecological interactions uh, change <clears throat> quite a bit, okay? So we tend to s generalize and say that nearshore physical forces, such as ultraviolet light, uh, warm temperatures, waves crashing in there, uh, the physical forces play uh, a stronger role in the ecology uh, and the, in determining the distribution and abundance of species. But as you move into deeper water, biological interactions like competition, feeding, or herbivory, and predator-prey interactions uh, play a more prominent role. These, this part of the reef system is said to be biologically accommodated. In other words, what it's, uh, we're saying is that um, interactions between organisms over time have created a stable system in which everybody sort of coexists within, um, uh, within the framework of uh, predator-prey interactions and the like. These are long-term interactions that have evolved into what is a sustainable uh, functioning ecosystem. And in this slide, we see uh, an illustration of this zonation phenomenon um, and this is from uh, an example of a Pacific uh, fringing reef. Fringing means that it's directly connected to, uh, to the shoreline. Um, and so, you know, here's our system again. This is a little bit like what we saw in San Sal, but it's a little more descriptive of what interactions dominate the different regions. So it's more about zonation and physical forces and other forces that determine zonation rather than connectedness between the different components of the reef system. Okay, so you have seagrasses here, reef flat and patch reefs uh, along here, and then we have a reef crest, and um, this is an example now of a barrier reef with these heavy branching corals that create a buffer uh, for everything behind them. Uh, and then you go into the reef front in the deeper water uh, where uh, there are lots of massive corals and long-term interactions going on. So if we look at what shapes and what determines who lives where uh, and, and, and what the interactions are along this, uh, along this zonation pattern, in shallow water, physical forces dominate. Okay, Ultraviolet light, as I mentioned, temperature extremes. The corals are small, very resistant to stress. They grow really fast to take advantage of good conditions and the like. By the time you move to the reef, crest, we have a little bit more stable system because there's more of an influence of the open ocean. Okay, so there's not the temperature extremes that we saw uh, near shore, but there are still brutal physical forces at work here in terms of wave impact that affect the reef crest uh, and the reef, uh, the upper area of the reef front here in this barrier uh, reef system. So wave impact plays a key role here. And if you're gonna live in this area, uh, you better be very tough or flexible to be able to withstand the constant beating uh, of the ocean. So again, physical forces dominate along the reef crest. But when you get to the reef front, now we have a very stable system. Temperature is modulated. There's not that much light. Um, there's no real wave action to impact, say, 20 meters down. And as a result, we have uh, a place where the biological accommodation is taking place, where um, biological interactions play a key role in determining who's abundant and who's not and, um, uh, and how things are distributed in these regions and what kinds of things can live there. So the reef front 
a much more stable environment is where biological interactions really play a key role. So there you tend to find the larger corals that grow more slowly um, because they want to be more competitive as opposed to growing fast to take over the habitat quickly before something comes along to destroy you like a big a storm and the like. Okay, so this is an example then of zonation, different zones in a reef system created by different kinds of conditions um, that are at work as determinants of uh, abundance and distribution. Continuing our discussion of reef structure, we're going to talk about three-dimensionality uh, and sort of um, relief uh, in the architecture of the reef. And as you know, we've talked about this before, corals create a complex 3D framework, three-dimensional framework um, that is essentially a good description of the reef system uh, and all of its nooks and crannies and ups and, and downs. There's a lot of verticality in healthy, uh, in healthy reef. So there is a reef framework, uh, and that reef framework creates a complex and diverse habitat for lots and lots of different things um, to live in, okay? So we can say corals, and we've said this before, are ecosystem uh, engineers in that they modify the environment in a significant manner that creates a refuge and a habitat uh, for other organisms, okay? So ecologists describe the complexity of the framework in a coral reef system by what's called an index of rugosity. So now, this is something that's uh, important, this three-dimensional architecture of the reef, and ecologists say, well, we better be able to measure this somehow. And so these indices have been devised that are actually very easy to put into practice, as you'll see. So imagine your project was to measure the rugosity. This is how we uh, describe this uh, three-dimensional relief of a reef system, is rugosity. Uh, and your, your job as a researcher is to measure the rugosity of different reef systems. Well, it's actually very easy to do um, because it's just simply a matter of comparing um, the ratio of the distance covered by a rope, let's say, a weighted line or a chain or something like that, um, compared to how much linear distance it would cover if you draped it over the reef itself. So it really takes, by draping it on, over the reef, you're taking into account the three-dimensional relief uh, of the reef system. So we've got a 20-meter chain, let's say, or a 20-meter rope so we don't kill uh, the corals, and we layer it over the reefs, and we see, in fact, that it doesn't, or that it uh, extends to a length of only 12 meters. So I've come up with some uh, sort of fake numbers for you here to consider. So it's a 20 meter length rope that only travels a linear distance of 12 meters when we dra drape it over the reef. Well, we can use that information to calculate a rugosity index. And there are two ways to do that. It's a very simple formula, really. One is the rugosity is equal to one minus D, and D is, um, the length of the rope on a direct line, once it's draped over the reef, uh, all divided by L, which is the actual length of the rope, uh, if you extend it uh, completely flat out, okay? So in this case, uh, the rugosity gets smaller until it gets to zero. So if there was a flat reef, your line that you put down will extend to 20 meters exactly its distance, say, if you had taking the measurement along the shoreline or something like that, okay? The other index of rugosity is a, a little more straightforward. It's simply the length of the rope divided by the distance, the linear distance that it extends if you drape it over the reef. So in the case of a rope that was 20 meters long that only um, extends to a linear distance of 12 meters, if you drape it over the three-dimensional reef, then our rugosity would be 20 divided by 12. And so in this case, an R of 1 is a flat reef because it'll be the ratio of 20 divided by 20. 
uh, which would be equal to one. So these are just different ways that we measure uh, rugosity. The big deal here is that it looks like over time, if we go back to the 1960s all the way to 2010 in this particular study that was completed in 2009, uh, if you look at the rugosity of Caribbean reefs, and this is taking into account lots of reef systems, it has dropped from about an average of three. Remember, our lowest value is one in the L over D formula, right? And it looks like the rugosity has dropped where there was an average of around three long ago into the 60s and 70s, and then it dropped uh, quite rapidly to a low point uh, in the mid 80s and early 90s, stayed pretty consistent for some time after that, but it seems to have, un, you know, have another downward slope here uh, in, in the late 1990s. And we can kind of look for explanations of this in the ecology of these systems and our understanding to what happened in these regions in the past. Between the 1970s and early 80s, there was a region-wide collapse in the big branching corals, like Elkhorn coral and Staghorn coral. Uh, and as soon as those corals, mostly through diseases, began to die, then the rugosity of the reef began to decline. When you lose the branching high corals, of course, um, the three-dimensionality will decrease. Uh, at the same time, there was lots of loss of major herbivores, including an important sea urchin that we'll talk about later, and herbivorous fishes and the like, and so that led to um, sort of further decline uh, in rugosity until the, the system kind of flattens out at about one and a half uh, and stays that way for quite a long time. Uh, and so until about the late 90s or so where we begin to see uh, another decrease uh, in the slope that it goes closer to one, closer to a flat reef completely. And we can point to the beginning of bleaching in the late 1990s 97 and 98, massive bleaching events all over the Caribbean, um, nutrient loading from uh, coastal uh, operations, co coastal farming and the like, and further loss of uh, herbivorous fish that might have accounted for this last, uh, this last drop. So sort of three phases in the rugosity of Caribbean reef systems, but um, undoubtedly uh, a disturbing trend in a decrease in rugosity over time. Why is this important? Why is it important that reefs are flatter? Well, we can go back and uh, um, sort of add some substance to what we've already discussed, and that is that uh, the more three-dimensional a reef is, the more rugosity a reef has, the more habitat it's going to create, and the greater the species diversity. And that's certainly been shown in um, many different ways, but there's uh, this one here that I think is um, notable, and that is that the fish species richness uh, in Caribbean reef systems is uh, strongly related to the complexity and rugosity of the reef. This is the uh, R-square of the regression, which is pretty good. Um, so that means that as um, complexity increases, species richness increases, and of course, uh, it goes the other way as well. As complexity decreases, um, so does the species richness in the system. Uh, and so this loss in rugosity, mainly affected by corals uh, over time, right, has contributed probably to a decrease in species diversity all around, but especially in the diversity of fish species in the Caribbean. All right, the next important aspect of uh, community ecosystem organization and structure that we want to talk about is diversity itself, right? And we can, as you know, uh, we've established already that um, coral reefs are the primary habitat uh, for uh, fish diversity uh, globally in the oceans. There's nothing like reefs. They cover only about 3% of the world's oceans, but, but have more than 50% 
of the fish, uh, fish diversity. So reefs are amazing in terms of their ability to sustain uh, diverse fish uh, communities or assemblages, as we might say. And one of the reasons for that, obviously, is, as we've talked about, is habitat complexity. So just look at some of these numbers up here. 2,100 species of fish uh, in reefs around the Philippines. 507 just around the little Bahamas um, that we're going to visit. But that pales to what we see in some of the Great Barrier Reef regions. 500 or more species on around one Great Barrier Reef island. It's probably uh, Lizard Island, which has been very well studied along on the Great Barrier Reef system on the east coast of Australia. So we can say certainly habitat complexity plays a key role, uh, is a key determinant in terms of allowing this kind of uh, tremendous um, fish species diversity. Okay, and of course, you can see that that the diversity of the reef system itself, to some extent, the rugosity, but the different kinds of habitats that exist, just create a whole variety of different zones, microhabitats, um, areas of the reef that different species of fish are able to adapt to. Okay, so that uh, fish species have essentially, through ecological interactions and evolution, um, partitioned, right? This is called niche partitioning. Have partitioned the reef ha habitat so that they specialize in living in uh, only some particular regions. Um, there's even a diurnal nocturnal uh, difference. So if you live during the daytime, you might be feeding on different foods than if you lived at night. So um, this kind of differences in activity could also be considered yet another way of breaking up the environment, allowing multiple species um, to live in it. And that's the point here. So we know that habitat complexity is an important component <clears throat> in terms of producing the great species uh, diversity of fishes that we see in coral reefs <clears throat> worldwide and even within individual reefs. Um, themselves, right? We already have a sense for the habitat itself being uh, crucial. <clears throat> but there seem to be other things at work. Uh, and in particular, researchers have really tried to explain so, for some time why there are, are so many species of the same things in, uh, in reef systems. For example, 14 species of parrotfishes uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, quite a few species of damsels and angelfish, and uh, so there seem to be this these groups that are just very successful and specious. And yes, of course, habitat complexity is important. But researchers have identified other uh, possible explanations for this great diversity. And so, in the next slide, we'll start talk about that a little bit. Okay, so here are our explanations. Um, besides habitat complexity, we have three hypotheses, which rely more on aspects of ecology like competition, recruitment, uh, and disturbance, and some combination thereof as being factors that promote coexistence, and by promoting coexistence, you promote uh, species diversity, specializations, and, uh, and alike. So let's begin. Uh, and let's talk about these three explanations. One is the intensity of competition, okay? So in this kind of a situation, uh, this is called an equilibrium hypothesis because um, the species are uh, in this system and it's their interactions that really determine uh, evolution and a phenomenon called niche partitioning or niche uh, diversification. In other words, uh, Competition promotes coexistence by forcing specialization uh, and thereby minimizing the interactions and the negative interactions between species. So again, this is called an equilibrium hypothesis. Just intense competition leading to coexistence. Uh, the second explanation is sort of more a recruitment uh, phenomenon and argues that recruitment is a bit of a lottery. Recruitment means the arrival of young, right? Most of these fish spawn their eggs 
and the eggs and larvae drift in the ocean and they eventually come and settle down on the reefs. And it just so happens that some, go some years may be good for this species, uh, but the next year might be bad for that same species, but better for another. And so on any given year, different species will succeed in terms of recruitment as determined by variables outside the reef, right? Uh, and survive. So if you do well one year, you're going you're gonna to be the most abundant fish around for that year group. But the next year, you don't do as well in terms of recruitment, and other species might do better. And over time, this sort of shift in dominance uh, really allows for coexistence because no one gets to dominate uh, consistently over time. So this is a non-equilibrium hypothesis because it's not the interactions within the reef that determine the diversity. It's just sort of this lottery of recruitment. Okay. The third explanation is um, predation and disturbances, so that the action of predation keeps essentially keeps dominant species from taking over um, the habitat. Same for physical disturbances like storms, heavy wave action, hurricanes or typhoons. Um, they come in and they disrupt the local species interactions, preventing the dominant species from outcompeting um, the less successful species, and therefore, um, thereby everybody coexists uh, in the reef system. So predation, in that sense, is just another type of disturbance, like some of those physical disturbances, storms, uh, and the like. Uh, there's a very interesting idea called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis that we'll talk about later on, uh, which argues that it just has to be the right amount of disturbance or the right amount of predation. If you have too much of it, then it's detrimental to diversity. Uh, and if you don't have enough of it, then the dominant species tend to take over. So you have to have an intermediate level of these disturbances in order to promote the coexistence and the great diversity that we see in these reef systems. Of course, a key component of uh, the structure of a reef system, a reef system or any ecosystem for that matter, or any community, uh, it's its trophic web. And so we see here sort of one version of a coral reef uh, trophic web with uh, corals here on the right, seaweeds uh, and other algae uh, on the left as the base of the food web. And then, of course, uh, some very important players uh, in the system, such as, for example, uh, grazers, herbivores, play a key role in keeping seaweeds and such at bay. Uh, because they do compete for space uh, with corals. So if there's not enough grazers in the system, the algae might win over the corals and wipe out on the reef. Predators that feed on corals and other invertebrates uh, in the system are the plankton feeders. And somewhere on the top are <clears throat> the top predators, uh, which um, occupy different habitats, like squids are important predators. They eat little snails and the like. Obviously, sharks are important top carnivores in reef systems by feeding on other fish or bottom invertebrates and the like. And there are even some predatory snails um, that uh, play a key role by uh, eating sea urchins, for example, or eating sea cucumbers. Uh, it'd be very unlikely for a snail, though it happens to actually uh, catch a fish of any kind uh, to prey on it. So this is essentially <clears throat> the food web. Uh, and I guess what the takeaways are here uh, is basically the importance of corals uh, and seaweeds as sort of the base of the food web. It's odd to see animals as the base of a food web. But remember, corals are growing and producing lots of carbon because they have algae, zooxanthellae, right? Those dinoflagellates uh, inside of them. And then we have the primary consumers, which are mostly grazers, um, detritus feeders, plankton feeders, and coral and mucus feeders, and then the top carnivores. The food webs are much more complex than this, but at least you see the three basic uh, components of the system. And I highlighted some of the important uh, interactions. Apex predators, like sharks, supposedly pay, play a very important role in maintaining um, the structure of um, of just essentially all marine ecosystems, but uh, especially in coral reefs and the loss of sharks due to shark, you know, fishing and shark fin um, harvesting, 
uh, and so on uh, can be a real problem then in terms of breaking the compl breaking the integrity of these uh, of these food webs. This slide here summarizes the diagram uh, in the previous slide, so I'll leave it up to you to um, to review. It really is just a written description of some of the things that we. Um, we, that I talked about as I described the, the diagram in the previous page for you. But it highlights not only the important interactions, but some of the important players in the system and what they do uh, within the food web structure. And there are many species in the system that depend on coral um, directly for food. In the Pacific, some sea stars, which we'll talk about Next time are important predators of corals. Uh, butterfly fishes feed on coral eggs uh, and larvae. Um, parrot fishes will eat coral, but it's almost incidentally because they're just grinding away trying to eat algae, primarily off rocks and the like. Trigger fishes uh, drop down to the bottom and munch on corals uh, pretty heavily. So in one way or another, corals play uh, a key role as sort of the base of the food web in different, uh, different reef systems. And of course, we know that they play a key role in terms of um, sand production and calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate uh, accretion and accumulation in these reef systems that contribute to lots of, um, sort of physical structure. So this is a summary of what we just went through, um, different aspects of the reef structure, reef organization. Um, so I'll leave this to you for you to go over in detail, but just to highlight what we went through, um, there's a continuum that a reef is really part of a, of a system of, eco, uh, uh, of different communities, different ecosystems um, that the reef, the type of reef and uh, zones of a reef are determined by physical and biotic or biological factors, uh, and that they change with distance from shore, with physical factors being more important near shore, and then <clears throat> biological factors being more important in deeper, uh, more stable uh, environments. Reefs have a 3D, degree, uh, 3D architecture, three-dimensional architecture, that contributes to habitat diversity, and we know that with habitat diversity, you get fish diversity and basically species diversity uh, on the reef. Fish diversity is especially high on coral reefs, uh, remarkably high, and that we talked about how important uh, habitat variety, habitat diversity was to that, um, but <clears throat> that there were other forces uh, at work, such as variations in recruitment, competition leading to niche uh, partitioning and physical forces that create different levels of stability uh, in the environment. And then lastly, we talked a little bit about the food web uh, and the food web interactions on these reef systems. And that concludes this lecture. The next one is going to be on dynamics, sort of the details of the interactions between um, the key components of uh, coral reef systems focusing on the Caribbean.